allow me to introduce our panel tonight. Alice Kessler-Harris is the R. Gordon Hoxie Professor of American History at Columbia and the former president of the Organization of American Historians. She specializes in the history of American labor and the comparative and interdisciplinary exploration of women and gender. And she has begun planning her upcoming online course, Women Have Always Worked, for Columbia X on edX, based on her book of the same name. Stephanie McCurry is a specialist in 19th century American history with a focus on the American South, uh, the Civil War era, uh, and the history of women and gender. Her book, Confederate Reckoning, Power and Politics in the Civil War, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for History. Her free online course, History of the Slave South, explores the relationship between slavery and democracy and is available on Coursera. And Eric Foner is our leading contemporary historian of the post-Civil War Reconstruction period, having published Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863-1877, winner of many prizes for history writing and more than 10 other books on the topic. Uh, Eric Foner's The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln, and American Slavery, won the Pulitzer Prize for History, Lincoln Prize, and the Bancroft Prize. And of course, his free online course on the Civil War and Reconstruction, published in 2014, is available from Columbia University on edX. Please join me in welcoming our three panelists tonight. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I want to start this conversation off by saying that I am the novice in this crew, that uh, both professors Foner and McCurry have made MOOCs before. I've just been talked into making one. And as a result, I am rather skeptical about the process. So we thought this evening, or at least I thought this evening, I would uh, start off this conversation by seeing if uh, Eric Foner and Stephanie McCurry couldn't convince me that making the MOOC was going to be an OK thing to do. And I pause to say, an OK thing to do for a historian. Uh, because I'm well aware that MOOCs have worked very well in the sciences and the technological fields and so on. But in the humanities, we're still a little more skeptical than, the, than our colleagues in the sciences or in the STEM fields are. So let me start by asking you both the major question. What's the point of making a MOOC? Why bother? Who wants to go <laughs> Eric, you go first. All right, well, I, 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 let me just, first I want to thank everyone for coming to this conference, and you know, I'm happy to be here and talk about this. I, I'm a, a, not the most obvious person to get involved in this. I'm a very low-tech sort of person. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, technological ability, as the people in our office will uh, attest. I'm always calling them, now that I can draw on their expertise, calling them for advice like my, I can't do this on my computer, how do you do it? But anyway, to me the reason for doing a MOOC was, to, from my mind, was simple. Our job, I'd say, is to disseminate knowledge to create and disseminate knowledge. It's to, we do it most of our time in a classroom with very excellent students, but obviously a limited number of them. The MOOC gives us the opportunity to reach a far broader, far more diverse audience, um, and that was the appeal to me in a nutshell. In a, in a way, it's not all that different from one of my great mentors when I was a student here, James P. Shenton, a great teacher of an earlier generation here, who back in the 1960s had a TV lectures on Channel 13 at 6 in the morning, sunrise semester, where he taught American history on Channel 13. And people watched this before they went to work. To me, it was now we have a better technology now. You can do a lot more things than you could do back in the 1960s. But it's the same basic idea. 
So to me, that's part of our job, and I think it, it makes, we have an obligation. There's so much misinformation out, about, out there about history, particularly maybe the era of history that Steffi and I both write about, about slavery, about the Civil War, about Reconstruction, myths, misconceptions, that um, you know, the ability to get what we consider an up-to-date modern view of that very pivotal period out there is, is very appealing. So to me, that was, that's the advantage of, of doing. Now, this, does it replace normal teaching? No, I don't think it does at all. I am old enough to believe that there is a value to having a professor in the classroom, human interaction with, with, between students. That's a different, so this is a different way of teaching and conveying knowledge. I don't believe it replaces the other way. It's, it's a supplement to it, but it enables us to, my MOOC reached retirees, teachers, people in all sorts of different countries, homeschoolers, Civil War buffs, people who knew nothing about the subject, Almost none of them would ever have been in a class of mine at Columbia. So to me, that was the appeal. And yet, Eric, you did what uh, Stephanie didn't do, or rather Stephanie did. That is, you walked into your classroom every day, and then you were filmed in the classroom. Right. So my, my, my MOOC was a little different than many, and certainly very different from Stephanie's, in that it, was, it is a college class. They, our team here came in with cameras, and they filmed me giving my lecture course on the Civil War Reconstruction era. For the last time, I'm retiring at the end of this academic year, and the le there was a year and a half ago, the last, this is the last time I was gonna give this course, I gave many, many times in the past, and I just liked the idea that it would be sort of out there, even though I wasn't teaching anymore, it'd be out there for people, but it's different. It, Stephanie's, and she'll talk in a second, obviously, was created by her as something new and different. Mine is a Columbia class to a large 250 students, the same way I would give it in a, 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 any time, but then changed in considerable ways when it was put into this MOOC format. But the fundamental you know, building block of it is my lectures in a classroom. So Stephanie, why did you choose a different I didn't model? entirely choose it. Uh, I was the first MOOC in history, certainly in the humanities at Penn. There weren't many history MOOCs two years ago when I started this. And the people at Penn who were working with Coursera, the Co Coursera platform, had this sort of, just like they made Eric break his lectures up into 10 minute clips, and in, they, there's certain rules you all have about what works. And one of the uh, commitments they had was that, um, that if I was to be filmed in my classroom, everybody on Coursera who was taking the MOOC would feel like an outsider to an experience that was actually going on somewhere else. And so it uh, really wasn't a choice on my part. In that sense, I was sort of led into the process that way. And I must say that uh, there were many minute moments in the middle <laughs> learning how to talk in front of a camera. We filmed on location in different places around campus where you know, it, it was very difficult for me. I, I would freeze in front of the camera. I had a cognitive problem thinking when the camera was on. It really took a while to get used to it. But your big question about would I tell you to do it, there were many moments in the middle when I thought, why the hell am I doing this? Like, I, I could write 12 books by the time I've done this. But in the end, I got out of it exactly what I wanted, which isn't that different than what Eric just said. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to talk to 18 to 22 year olds but there's a lot of reasons to talk to people who aren't 18 to 22. And after years of teaching this course on the history of the slave South, I'm not American, I had come to this as a foreigner, I had always thought that this piece of American history was a part of something much bigger about the making of the modern world, and I always, I felt like I wanted to test that proposition with an audience that was self-selecting, like I didn't know, would anybody take this course? I mean, I, the people who backed it at Penn, I would think, what are they doing? Like, who's gonna take this? But that's the beauty of MOOCs. You put them out there, and then you know, there are all these people. So my reasons were I really, wanted, I really wanted to see if it was true that you could have a mass democratic conversation about history. I was an undergraduate chair in my department while history enrollments were tanking, and I thought we could not afford to sit this out. Historians need to be represented in this technology. And the other thing is, I think there's a huge gap, increasingly, 
between the value that's placed on a history degree in a university setting, including by parents, and people's own hunger for that comprehension of the world. I mean, historians anchor area studies programs. They're the core of many kinds of interdisciplinary uh, pr proceedings inside the university. But they're also like the last generalists. You know, you can go out and talk to anybody about anything. And there's a real hunger to understand these things. The conversations we had, the heart of this course was the discussion board. And the conversations that went on in that discussion board were a revelation to me. And so the challenge the first time while we were still taping was to be clear enough of time that I could be on the discussion board. But um, I got out of it exactly what I wanted. Well, let, let me push you both a little bit. Uh, you know, historians, we always say we stay in business by revising each other, that we are an interpretive field, not a scientific field in any way. And yet, when you're in a classroom, you have in front of you a community of people who are, I mean, however large they are, it's a limited community. You can say what you want to say or need to say. When you're being filmed on camera for something that's going to go out into the world and last many years and that you have no control over, can you make the same interpretations? Can you be as courageous? Can you be as brave? Do you censor yourselves? I mean, that's a very good question. For example, this spring I am teaching my final course is this another lecture course I've given many times on the history of American radical movements. I'm not making a MOOC out of that because in that course we talk about issues that I don't, you know, it's not that I'm saying anything I don't believe, but I don't want it out there on the internet for anyone to see. It is, I'm geared to a group that's right there and I think it's, it would change if I knew that somebody might be seeing and hearing every single thing I say. In this case, I, I taught that course exactly as I always do, um, but what Alice said is true. I then, this is time consuming, I then went back and viewed every single lecture, which is a lot of time consuming, and edited out certain things. You know, so sometimes you say things in a class that you may not want floating around. That's a really stupid book, you know? Well, you know, you might say that, or, or you know, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about, but that guy might be viewing this MOOC, you know, and you don't, you know, you want to maybe tone down a little bit the offhand remarks you may make in a lecture. We also, you say things to be provocative in class, but I didn't change very much. Um, I, I really, the, the other side of the, the thing, you know, I see what Stephanie did and it's great, but I, I think what I wanted was people to see what a Columbia class is like. They see what it is. Now, maybe they feel like outsiders, they're not sitting there, but this is what a class at a top-notch university is. And for people who are not in college, which is most of the people taking it, that's a kind of interesting thing to find out. So that's the other side of doing it the way I did it instead of the way Stephanie did it. I mean, I felt like the, um, on the substance of the matter, you lose the spontaneity when you do the recorded mm -hmm. lecture thing. And that's true. I felt that loss. And that was part of what was difficult about learning to talk in front of a camera, is you're not being actually, you're not seeing people react. You're not goaded on. But you're also not goaded on to make those remarks like about what you read in the newspaper this morning, either, that you might say when you open class. Which so is how I less, start every single class. Exactly. You know? So there was less editing, shall we say, required in mine. Uh, because the usual sarcastic throwaway remarks weren't really there. And that, yes, something is definitely lost. Like my students in my classrooms see a different personality than what the MOOC people called Professor Steph by the end. Um, but on the other hand, in terms of the substance of the material, like honestly, I think it got better. Because I, my lecture course, my MOOC is my undergraduate lecture course, but it's the lean, fighting version. I dumped the, the soggy middle of the course. I got rid of the lectures that didn't work. It's 10 weeks instead of, what, what is it, 15 or 14 by the time we have exams and breaks. And it was very thematically focused, which I use the same lectures back in my class now. They're better. The, the visuals are way upgraded, because uh, I didn't make them. And um, 
there was a feedback loop from the MOOC to the class, but I also, uh, uh, so I don't think I sacrificed anything in the substance of the course. I think I sacrificed spontaneity. And I don't think your personality comes through in quite the same way when you're not, just like when I give a talk, people always enjoy the Q&A more than the talk. So it's a different thing. I, I like to be uh, sometimes humorous in class, and in the class, they laugh. Yeah. But if you're trying to tell a joke to a camera, yeah. it's not quite the same <laughs> thing, right? So talk a little bit about audience. Uh, you, you know, you're teaching a class of undergraduates. You expect them to have read certain kinds of material in preparation to be looking forward to a particular kind of exam or to be preparing research papers. So you've got that in your mind when you're talking to them. But if you're talking to a group of people who might be retirees or physicians or whoever else they might be, do you expect the same thing? Can you really keep the level of the course, the level of interpretive energy the same? I think the people in my, my course, I say, was the same I always give. I did not change the level. I didn't change anything much. But um, I think most of the people in the MOOC appreciated that. It, it was a step up for them, in a sense. It was challenging. Very. And I think, now, the people for whom it was too challenging dropped out, I guess. But um, I think a lot, judging from comments we got at the end, you know, a lot of them like being challenged. Some people were, I never thought I could get to the end of a college, I haven't been in college in 35 years, I never thought I could get to the end of a college course again, but I did, and I did, I got my certificate or whatever it is, you know. So, I, I think the question of the level is, but I think you always pitch yourself to a level you think is a little bit above what the audience might be, whether you're out lecturing just to, in an audience, or in a general public, or in this thing, and to try to raise their level, so to speak. I think we had an issue with that. I know I certainly did because um, the lectures, the lectures are what are the lectures I wrote and delivered. Uh, as somebody at History News Network said, "Are you ready to be globally fact-checked?" So they were locked down well, and tight. Yeah, like they were better probably than what they had been in the, you know, over 15 years. The comments you write on the margins, the things you get read to keep yourself interested in the subject. The letters, the lectures had started to sprawl all over themselves, and it was really a wonderful opportunity. But what we discovered is when we got that global conversation and that big democratic conversation, that's different than a tutorial with a TA sitting there on a Friday afternoon saying, now, what does this document say? We had documents every week. But what we discovered at the beginning was that the discussion, even though we put a discussion question on the board that we regarded as directly related to the primary source documents, in the first couple of weeks, it was like Facebook. Everybody was just talking about what they thought and what they thought it was like. So for example, on the first week on the African slave trade, we asked the question, um, does the, uh, do you see any impact of the African slave trade in your part of the world? And it was phenomenal. People were uploading pictures of monuments to uh, you know, slaves on the Liverpool docks, Danish slave ships. It was fantastic. But then the second week, when it got down to business with documents about, say, I don't even remember, slavery in Virginia, people started talking about slavery and genocide and Nazism and unfree labor. And we were like, oh my god, no, this isn't how historians talk. And then we had to start using the discussion board and modeling an answer to say, no, actually historians talk from evidence. We don't make huge leaps. You can't just talk about if you want to talk about the legacy of slavery in the 20th century, we can have that conversation, but you can't go from the 17th century to the 20th century. So we had to figure out ways. It really made me understand how much teaching you do in person. Like when you lecture, implicitly you think you're modeling a method. How you reason, how you use evidence. But I was forced to be explicit about that, and I think that helped my teaching too. Mm. And then we had to be literally explicit on the discussion board. When you answer this question, please refer to the piece of the document that secures your answer sort of thing. So we had to teach the method we thought we were showing, mm. but then you have to be explicit. And within a three weeks, the conversation changed, and people stopped making wild analogies. And I mean, it would go on on the margins, but there was, and then people started uh, curbing each other, mm -hmm. or 
doing that to each other. You know, I don't think that's right. The 17th century had these conditions, you know. So it was interesting in that way. So here's the challenge, though. You're both talking about courses which have relatively high standards and pretty clear assessments. So why are you so unwilling to give undergraduate credit for these courses? Why do you, both of you, sort of signed off on <laughs> courses that would not carry? Well, mine, mine did not have assignments that were anything like, OK, why, why, why do students think history courses are hard? Because they have to read 200 pages a week. You cannot ask people on a MOOC to read 200 pages a week. They're going to read what they want. Plus, on Coursera, at least as I understood it, all the materials had to be free and openly accessible. So I had no problem finding <laughs> primary source materials, but I couldn't use anything behind the JSTOR wall. I couldn't use excerpts from books. So that whole level of interpretation that we engage in teaching students how to read other historians' work, where they make the argument, how you take issue with it, that whole element was missing from my course. And we just decided to kind of embrace it, and we didn't do grading at all. We did assessment, but we didn't mm -hmm. do grading. And in that sense, it bears no resemblance to a rigorous, it does in the content, but in the, in, in the sense that you only learn by doing, which I increasingly believe, like history is kind of like a, a workshop or lab <laughs> uh, discipline, mm -hmm. um, it's a completely different experience. That's what, that's what the parents are paying for at Columbia. Let me uh, just to respond to two things. One, um, I would have to say that the discussion boards in my MOOC were less successful, maybe than in yours, or maybe less successful than I had hoped or expected. Um, I found it, and I had TAs who were monitoring these discussions, I found it very hard to keep people on subject yes. all the way through. And very often, just opinion became equated with history, you know? Yes. And especially, on the one hand, in, when I lecture, I do relate what's, what the history we're talking about to what's going on in the present, and it's not that hard in the Civil War era when people were debating whether we should show flags or, you know, all sorts of things. Um, but too many people just jumped immediately to their, to politics, current politics. That's fine, I don't care, but, you know, and. Um, and a few, I think, got very out of hand and really tried to hijack these things, and some of them were borderline racist, I'd have to say, and we had to face a question, what do you do? Do you just shut someone down if they're insulting a whole race of people and creating an atmosphere which is not conducive to an educational you know, discussion? I don't think we ever really solved that problem. Maybe now that it's going on again, maybe we will, but um, I, I found the discussion boards too scattered and um, not, not historical enough in a certain sense, but that's understandable because most of these people didn't have any real historical background in the period, but when you get to the Civil War, at least in the United States, everyone seems to have an opinion whether they know anything or not. But, you know, this will improve over time. Why don't I want credit? My answer is different, and I don't want to be a killjoy in this conference. I do not, and I, I lecture a lot around the universities, colleges, community colleges, and I see online education and MOOCs basically being used as a way for administrators to get rid of faculty, to put it in the bluntest way. Universities all over the country, colleges are under financial pressure. You, it's much cheaper to use a MOOC of somebody's than to have a real professor in the room. I do not want my MOOC to be used somewhere instead of a real professor or teacher on the ground. That's why I will not let it be used, to the extent I can control this, I will not let it be used for college credit because I think you should be in a course with a professor in your place. There are people who are using it as a supplemental thing in their course. They talk to me. I'm so showing some of your stuff. That's fine. I have no objection to that in the slightest. I think that's great. But I don't want to be party to what I see going on in, high, in a lot of places, and on, not at Columbia and Penn, but at less affluent places where online education is decimating the faculty. I don't want to see that. I don't want to be part of that. Could you have uh, made these MOOCs without graduate students? I mean, could you have done it on your own? No. <laughs> it was so much work. I mean, I was given a, a sort of stipend to develop and teach this course. And honestly, I think I made 49 cents an hour by the time the thing was finished. I've never worked so hard in my life because I, 
I got, first of all, I rewrote all the materials, I wrote a promo script, I chose all the primary sources, whatever, and then, and then I got scared in front of the camera. I, I, I couldn't take more than half a lecture at a time because it, I, it was just like a big energy suck. And I was teaching. I would teach the course in College Hall on Monday and Wednesday at 11 to 12, and on Tuesday and Thursday I would go in and tape the you're, thing. You are overworked. I was a little overworked. And um, the thing I loved the most about it was that it takes a team. It also takes a lot of money, which is why there's a, I mean, there's another democratic element of this, which is who gets to make them. Um, that costs a lot of money because it takes a lot of bodies. And one of the things we were grappling with the whole time was, as you asked, I think, Alice, to Eric and I prior to uh, coming over tonight, is the difference between, say, a history MOOC and another kind of MOOC is that this, is, this, I think, also bears on the question of four credit online history courses, is if you're just going to have people watch lectures and take multiple choice quizzes, I want no that, part of that. That's not a course. That yeah. is not a course. But uh, we didn't even do that. We had to bring more and more people on board, even to run the discussion board. And when I did my MOOC for alumni, it was double teamed um, because we didn't want the discussion board to be this. I mean, you, there's to a, a, an extent, you can't prevent that scattering. But we were trying to teach on the discussion board as well. That's what we discovered we had to do. So it takes a lot of people. We also had to ask Coursera to change things about how the platform worked. We had mandatory postings once a week. Really? Mm. And at the beginning, you had to scroll to the bottom to add your post, and there were 16,000 people in the course. <laughs> so that was like, hello, do you think you could put change the button configuration so that people can enter the loop <laughs> at the top? So. Um, they were, and when I tried to explain this to one of the Coursera people, they kind of looked at me like everything should be scalable. So why isn't this scalable? But I don't think it's, in, it's scale, I think, I think history and the humanities, the scalable issue is, is a problem that's, uh, you guys correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, but it seems to me we have not. It still takes a lot of people to teach history, that, that, luckily. That, well, that, that is really a critical difference between a MOOC and a course in a classroom because now we have graduate TAs, but basically the course in the classroom is you're, you're doing it yourself. It's, it's a one-person show. A MOOC is a collaborative venture, and Definitely. it involves a lot of people, a lot of different inputs. Um, I worked with a whole bunch of very fine people in our Columbia office there. Uh, but, you know, when you're in a collaborative thing, not everything works out exactly the way you wanted it. People, as like Stephanie, they said, is said you know, they said, hey, we've got to break this up into these little segments. People can't, I said, I don't want to break my lecture up into these little segments. Well, we had to do it. I was convinced by them that that is how people register information in, a, in, in an online setting. Um, some of the things I wanted to do, I really didn't want to do, and we didn't do, but... Um, and then, yes, graduate students. By the way, I didn't get paid a penny, so I got paid even less than you did. Now, I didn't work as hard because I'd already given the course, you know. <laughs> but um, the graduate students got paid, as they should. And um, th right, to monitor discussions requires people. My head TA, Tim Schenk, was very good, worked a lot on the questions that were asked. Another couple of people, um, uh, Mary Freeman and then Ty, who's not a TA, he works in the library, worked on getting primary documents together yeah. and putting them up and questions about copyright. them. Copyright? Copyright yeah. issues takes a team oh, right we, on we, its own. Uh, we don't believe in copyright. We didn't care. <laughs> but, um, uh oh. Oh, wait, I think I, that, maybe that's you better not edit that out. No, wait, I'll take that back. I'll take that back. We only use things in public domain. Yeah. L library of Congress has a lot of great images, so they we don't do. have to worry about that. But, um, no, you have to research that, obviously. We were, actually, I was lucky because I had done two um, exhibits over the past mm -hmm. years, you know, one on, uh, on this era, one at the Chicago Historical Society. So they were, and then the Virginia, they were willing to give us anything we, want, we wanted free yeah. because I knew those people and I had worked with them. So that, and between that and Library of Congress, you got a million images and everything. But yes, copyright. People in the MOOC said, well, why aren't you just posting these readings for free? And I said, well, we can't post chapters of somebody's book yeah. for free. There is a copyright law that prevents that. You can go out and read it, that's fine, but that's the difference between a MOOC and a course in a college, because in a college, they got to go and read the assignment.
and in pay a book, for it. It's recommended, but there's no way to force them to go and buy the book and read it. I mean, the labor issue, which you discussed, is a hugely consequential one. And I don't want this point I'm about to make to be seen as in conflict with that or competition with that. But I did like, I mean, online education is also uh, an employment engine. And I really ended up liking the fact that I could become this little hub of employment for my underpaid graduate students. Well, that's true. Um, and, you know, PhDs in American history who come on board with online education and enter their, you know, work their career in that direction. Uh, one guy, Ben Wiggins, came on board just as my MOOC was getting started, and thank God, because there were no humanities people at Penn involved in online education. And you know, he's done extremely well. He instantly became the expert in that area uh, for us and worked out the kinks with me. And so you know, we ended up employing you know, a five or six people just to produce, I mean, I mean not besides the online office. Um, so I don't think that's inconsequential either. I mean, you know, I insisted that they were paid well when we did the alumni course. I particularly insisted that they were paid well. And, you know, that's not inconsequential either, I don't think. Right. The first time I discussed this with someone in our provost's office, which did, Columbia did put up a lot of money yeah. to pay for this MOOC. Somebody had to pay for it. There's a lot of time. There's a lot of equipment. There's a lot of people working on it. Yeah. The provost's office put up, I don't even know how much, but a lot of money. But once, I remember once when I was talking to them about this, uh, they said, well, won't graduate students just volunteer to do it? And I said, no, no, I'm sorry. You gotta, I'm volunteering to do it. That's a different Graduate matter. students have to be paid. I'm yeah. sorry. That was well, I had to be paid. And it's not un the reason, actually, is because I have two kids in college. So I, the other reason that I'm interested in uh, uh, this problem of mass higher education is when college professors can't pay for their own kids to go to college, you know you have a problem. The, the, there's, I don't know what country in the world has solved the problem. We all know we need to find, we need to offer higher education. And who has figured out how to, how to offer higher quality higher education at a cost any country can afford? So, you know, the United States has a corner on the quality education market, but it's phenomenally expensive. I don't, I don't think the answer is, you know, putting kids in front of a computer screen, which is happening all over the place. My nieces and nephews in Canada stand and tell me why online courses are awful because they don't finish them. It's, it actually turns out that if a human being takes an interest in you, you will learn better. It's a simple and uncomfortable and incontrovertible fact. So last question, would you do it again? From scratch? <laughs> From scratch. <laughs> I'm retiring, as I said. I, this is it. I've done it. I will now go and w become one of the retirees who watches M <laughs> Stephanie's MOOC. I think it's like everything else that you really invest a lot of labor in. It ends up being so rewarding. So yes, I would. Um, I've never done anything that was worth doing that wasn't a lot of work, so that was really not any different in the end. Writing a book is a lot of work. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll do that again, too. Yeah. We'll do that so. again. Well, that's terrific. Well, I feel a little better. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask? Right. The, the, the microphone will pick up if anyone has a question. I can't actually see. So. Behind the pole. <coughs> No questions? Uh, there's one way in the back over there. Um, my name is Elle Wang. I am a um, case in point. I am a graduate assistant um, helping a professor uh, doing two MOOCs, both in um, Coursera and edX. Um, my, my question is actually, um, it's I, well, I'm also a MOOC researcher, and then I've seen that uh, we're talking about a lot about um, uh, how to improve student learning outcomes and um, find a good rationale, well, basically why we're doing this MOOC. And it's interesting that uh, not too many discussions are centered around a um, instructor's point of view. So it's usually institutional's point of view or improve student outcomes. And it's really interesting uh, 
and it's really needed that we need more discussions around um, how we can help instructors who want to, you know, like offer their teaching resources online. And I know, like, uh, while well, also inspired from one of the previous talks um, this morning, and, and also inspired by um, both of your uh, comments that you mentioned about this, you know, personality transition that you have. Well, people have, you know, a general personality, and then you have a teaching personality. And there's also, I think, a third personality within the teaching personality. There's a teaching personality when you're you know, standing in a, in a podium in the actual classroom, and then there's another one when you're facing the camera. But then there are professors who can transition smoothly from you know, teaching in a physical classroom to um, a physical camera. And well, at least they did not you know, struggle too much by making the same kind of you know, like jokes and everything. I wanted to ask um, both of you, um, from your experiences, um, what, well, maybe like specifically how long um, does it take for you to, you know, be feeling comfortable teaching um, a 40 minute or even longer uh, course sections in front of a camera? And what would be your suggestion to a, you know, future faculty member who might be, you know, interested in moving toward this direction, but they might be concerned about it? You have to, I couldn't quite, the, the, uh, I, the acoustics in here don't make it a little hard to hear. You have to repeat the um, question. The qu somehow. She's asking how do you, she said, I was saying I c had trouble in front of the camera, but right. we have different teaching personalities anyway, sometimes right. in a seminar or at the l podium, right. whatever. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think really when, I, when I'm sort of complaining, you know, about how hard it was, what, I, what I'm really conveying is that I was shocked by that. I didn't expect it, and then, but you're absolutely right. It was simply a matter of time, and then there was another me, kind of, in front of the camera. I have no idea, because I can't watch them. That was another deal I made. I, if I, I'm so self-critical that if I had watched them all, I don't know how you did that. If I'd watched them all as they were being made, I would have pulled every video. <laughs> so I basically, one, the way I got over it, and the advice that I would give to someone who was co contemplating doing this and hadn't done it before, for me, the, crew, the key thing was this right-hand man I had, the, the alleged TA, who just basically was my shadow in this process. He is relentlessly intellectual. All he cared about was the ideas. He took care of all the other things, the copyrights, the discussion board. He did all those things. But he was there because he loved the, the material and the ideas. And so when I was in front of the camera, he was sitting there, and he would laugh at the jokes, and you know, and argue with me when the camera stopped, and it really helped me because it kept me thinking instead of going into this dead read a script. And one time, and so so did the people on in the online learning team that were usually there. And there was one day when everybody was gone, and it was a new film crew, and I was furious at everybody. Like, how am I supposed to do this? Um, sometimes it took us four hours or to get an hour of tape. And I have to say, the graduate students were pretty shocked at how time consuming it was to do it. I mean, they don't really know what we do anyway, but they were pretty shocked by that. Yeah. So I think having, I ha it took me a while to figure out how to access the notes while also making eye contact, and we didn't have a prompter. So there was all, there's all kinds of t things you can do to help the person. Um, but I, I think the key thing for me was having a real life person in the room who was actually engaged with me and the ideas and it kept me focused and alive. Because when I talk about, uh, when I give a regular lecture in a, a lecture hall, even with 300 people, I'm not reading a script. I'm thinking about what the issue is and I'm telling them. But for some reason, when the camera went on and I had to look, st literally stand on a piece of tape and look into a camera, I just went blank and it took me a while to get over that. Yeah, no, I, I, it, it's, it, everybody's teaching method varies. What you're comfortable with varies. Some people like lecturing. Some people prefer being in a seminar. Doesn't personality, experience. Mine was entirely different. I just got up there and gave this lecture. There were cameras in the room, but they were so far away. I, did, I forgot about them after one or two lectures. They were there, but it made no difference. So it was a very different kind of experience for me. Um, and, you know, and it only took an hour and 15 minutes. That was it. I think I would have preferred that um, because for that reason. Yeah, uh, that's you it. you would forget they're there. You forget they're there. You walk in. You do your thing. You, you, I talked, 
I talk conversationally in a lecture. Obviously, I don't read the thing. Right. I'm, but having people there makes it possible to do that. So here's what I've learned about making MOOCs. Yes. I've learned, A, I should get paid. <laughs> and where are the people who are here? B, uh, my graduate student, Suzanne Kahn, who is here, is already overworked and underpaid, and she should get paid more. All right. <laughs> uh, C, that the filming crew should be very patient, <laughs> very, very, very patient. And D, that I think it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. It will. It will definitely be fun. Well, thank you very so, much. Okay. You. So. And if we can have a round of applause for our faculty. <laughs>